as we come to, uh, uh, to this passage from, uh, from 1 Kings, we're, this is kind of part two uh, of the Elijah story that we started last week. Um, and I want to, before we kind of get into the story of what's going on here, I want to just uh, think of a little bit of background uh, from the story of Elijah. You see, the thing is, by, by this point in the history of God's people, uh, Israel, uh, they were hedging their bets when it came to worship. They were kind of, they were straddling uh, t- these two religious options that they had. O- on one hand, they had uh, the Lord, uh, as you can see in, in capital letters uh, in your Bibles, the Lord, uh, the God of Israel. And on the other hand, they had Baal, the God of the Sidonians. Now, the thing is that uh, the Lord was like their traditional God. He was the one from, from the past. They had all, all the stories from, uh, from kind of previously to this, how God brought his people out of Israel. You know, he was the God of uh, David and Saul and Solomon, who were their ancestors as well. But the God of Baal, or the, Baal, the God, he, he was very attractive. He was the God of fertility. You know, he was the one who could make you rich. He was the one who, who made the crops grow, or so they thought. He was the one who made the crops grow and the rain fall and made your animals productive. He was the one who blessed you with lots of children. He was a good God to have on your side. And so the Israelites, they were kind of... They were sort of hedging their bets. They were like, well, you know, we need the Lord for, for some stuff. You know, we know the Lord has done good stuff for us in the past, but right now we really want Baal. He's the one who can help us to get rich. He's the one who can help us to be productive, to, to get all the stuff that we want. So they weren't stopping their sacrifices and their worship of the Lord, but they were kind of mixing it together with a bit of this Baal worship as well. Now, this kind of hits the ground for us because although I'm, I'm fairly confident that, that most of us aren't going to be tempted uh, to go and, and bow down to, uh, to a little or a big idol that's got the head of a bull uh, and the body of a man, which is what Baal looked like. But I think there's lots of ways, aren't there, that we sort of mix our trust in the Lord with trusting in something else to provide for us. You know, maybe we, we trust in the Lord, but we also know that we need to trust in our job, uh, because if we don't trust in our job, then we're going to have no money. Or we trust in the Lord, we still come to church, we still do our quiet times, but we also make sure that every single day we spend a good time checking up on the football scores and making sure that our team is still doing well. Or maybe we trust in the Lord, but we know that the ultimate place where we find our uh, our satisfaction and our fulfillment is in relationships. Maybe that's, maybe that's in, uh, in our children or in our friends or in our, our partner. You know, that's, that's where we really need to go to find what we need. Well, what we see uh, and what we will see in this passage is that actually it is the Lord who provides all these things, and only the Lord is powerful enough to provide all these things. So uh, I've got kind of roughly sort of three points and an ending, uh, if you want to know where we're going. So challenge number one, contest number two, response number three, and finale number four. Okay, so let's start with the challenge into the passage now. Uh, So verse 16 and 17, Obadiah went to meet Ahab. If you want to know who Obadiah is, you can read the beginning of chapter 18. Um, uh, And Ahab comes to meet Elijah. Now, as I was reading this, I kind of imagined it a little bit like the Wild West. You know, sort of a a figure in the distance. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Kitching, is that you, troubler of Israel? You know, you see these two figures meeting on a desolate plain. Ahab the king, you know, he's the one with the power, he's the rich one, and Elijah the prophet. Uh, from, he, he's the guy from out of town, really. And, and Elijah says to him, Is that you, troubler of Israel? Elijah is seen as a troublemaker by Ahab, the man in authority. Why? Because Elijah keeps on insisting that the Lord is God. 
Elijah keeps on insisting that Ahab and the people of Israel shouldn't bow down to Baal. They should only bow down to the Lord because he is the one who has ultimate power over Israel. And and because of that, Elijah was seen as a troublemaker. You see, the thing is, when we say the Lord is God, or as we're more likely to say in this day and age, Jesus is Lord, and then the Lord is God, Jesus is Lord, that is a statement that can bring trouble to us. You know, when we sing the songs that we sing in church, as we stand, uh, as, as I stand here in front of the church, as we read the Bible, as we tell people, no, I believe that Jesus is the King, that is a subversive statement in our culture. It flies in the face of everything that our culture wants to think is important because it says, no, 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 actually what you think is important is not as important as Jesus. Jesus is the one true king. And as we step out and say, Jesus is Lord over the whole world, then people are going to look at us and say, you are troublemakers for saying that, for believing that. You are going to bring trouble in this land, just like Ahab accused Elijah of being a troublemaker, we too will be accused of being troublemakers for saying that Jesus is Lord. And so Elijah says to Ahab, okay, the point is we need to decide who is more powerful, Baal or the Lord. And so Elijah says, Every, everybody needs to come together on Mount Carmel. So the whole of Israel comes together. Now bear in mind, this is like tens if not hundreds of thousands of people are on this mountain. It's not actually just one mountain, it's actually like a mountain range. So a mountain range full of an entire nation who've come to see this contest. So we've got Elijah versus uh, the, the prophets of Baal, but we'll get to that bit in a second. Elijah turns to the people and he says, verse 21, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. You know, Elijah is saying to them, you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't have it both ways. No longer can you mix and match your religions because that's not going to work anymore. God's not going to stand for it anymore. You need to decide. But then what happens to the people at the end of verse 21? If Baal is God, follow him. If, if the Lord is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Absolute silence as Elijah looked at the people. Like he must have, I imagine if I was Elijah at this point, he must have been furious uh, with the people. It, You get the impression that Elijah is quite an emotional person anyway, so he must have been furious with them. And so, I think this was always going to happen all along, he says, okay, let's have a competition. Let's see who is really the most powerful. Is it Baal or is it the Lord? So we have the contest Section two. Ba 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 In the red corner, we have Baal. He rides on a chariot of fire. He makes the rainfall. He makes your cattle have lots of little cattle. He will make you rich and fertile. Woo, Baal, yeah, Baal. In the, in the other corner, whichever one I didn't just say, we have the Lord. He is the God of Isaac, of Israel, of Abraham, of Jacob. He is the God who brought you out of Egypt. He provides for all your needs. Silence. And so they have this contest. You know, they're standing on, on the mountain and they're facing down on each other. And, uh, and as you read through the contest, so the idea is that each side has an altar and a bull. So an altar is like a load of stones with some wood on top of it and a bull, uh, a dead bull that they've chopped up and prepared for a sacrifice on top of it. Uh, both sides have that. So you've got 450 prophets of Baal on one side and one Elijah on the other side. And the contest is which god can make fire come down uh, and, and make, make the sacrifice burn? You know, who is the most powerful? And so the prophets of Baal, Elijah's like, okay, well, you know, you you go first. 
you know, he's clearly not worried. And so, uh, verse 26, they took the ball that was given to them and they prepared it. They called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. So that's probably, I mean, depending on when the sunrise was, that's probably, you know, a good four or five hours that they were kind of calling on the name of Baal. But there was no response. No one answered. And so they they amp it up again. They start dancing. Uh, And then Elijah has been sitting there watching this spectacle for several hours, as have the people. And Elijah starts to, well, he starts to make fun of them. Shout louder, God, surely he is a God. You know, perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and maybe he must be awakened. The the thing is, like, their beliefs about Baal, their theology of Baal was that Baal is quite like us. So, Baal gets tired, and when he gets tired, he has to sleep. Baal is sometimes, when you pray to him, sometimes he's busy. That means he's on the toilet. And so, Elijah is saying, maybe Baal has gone to the toilet. So, he can't hear you right now. Maybe he's having a very long time on the toilet, maybe you're saying. You see, Baal is not always there. He can't always help you. He can't always hear your prayer. Baal is not omnipotent. He is not everywhere. He is not all-powerful. And so what do they do when Baal does not answer their prayers? Well, they think they need to step it up a notch. And and actually, this is really, really tragic uh, midday passed, and they continued their, verse 29, frantic prophesying until the time for the evening passed. Oh, no, it's the bit before that, 28. They shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. You see, their, their theology, their beliefs were that if, if their prayers weren't answered, they needed to offer a blood sacrifice. Their God wanted a blood sacrifice, their own blood so that he would answer. He was a bloodthirsty God. He not only demanded their prayers and the animals that they sacrificed, but their own physical blood. Their beliefs and their desires led them into this behavior. Sometimes idols demand us to make sacrifices that are huge and massive. And I think when, we, when you put it like that, sometimes the things that we look to to provide what we need can demand too much from us. They demand us to make pointless sacrifices or, or painful sacrifices for things that they can't deliver for us. I think a good example is work. You know, work promises, it promises satisfaction. It promises provision in the form of money. It promises us kind of uh, respect uh, from, from people and a position of importance and power in the world. So they're the things that work promises, but what does work demand of us? Well, work demands of us our, our time, our energy, you know, and they're fairly normal things. We're all willing to give time and energy to work, but But sometimes we feel we have to give more to work. Sometimes we feel we have to give all of our time. So we sacrifice our our family life or, uh, or our mental health because we're giving more of our time. We end up sacrificing our sleep uh, because work becomes more important uh, than sleep. And sooner or later, we realize that we've poured so much into to a certain project or a job that we're doing. And what do we get back from it? Sure, we might, we might have got the money, we might have got the promotion, but does it satisfy us? No. We, we're still in the, in the same position. It, it, our idol has not delivered the, the happiness that, that it promised. And there's other things that we can, we can look to for that as well. We can, we can think about relationships. You know, perhaps it, it's, a, it, it's our children or, or a partner or, or a friendship that we, we look to to provide everything that we need, and we feel that we have to put so much into this relationship, but then people let us down, because people always do. Or, as I've been watching a few Christmas adverts this week, sorry to talk about Christmas, but it is coming, uh, like, you know, Christmas promises so much, but, you know, we all know that Christmas never delivers everything that it promises. I, you know, I guess maybe, maybe there's a Santa analogy in there that I've not quite explored. Santa never delivers everything that he promises. And so just like 
just like the, the prophets of Baal who were called to sacrifice greatly for something that didn't deliver, so we too are. Five times the writer of 1 Kings records that there was no answer in verses uh, 26 and 29. Verse 29, verse 29, but there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Idols never deliver. And so Elijah steps up to the plate. Bear in mind, it's late on in the day. They've been there all day. The people have been on the mountain all day waiting for something to happen. So Elijah says, okay, okay, come here, come here. Let's, let's get cracking with this. And so he goes through this kind of this, this process, starting at verse 30, he goes through this process of rebuilding this altar. So this is obviously an altar that had been there from times past, but that had been destroyed by the Baal worshippers. And Elijah starts rebuilding this altar to the Lord. He repairs it with 12 stones, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then, uh, the, the strange thing is, he, he says to them, bring, uh, bring basically 12 jars of water, because it's four jars, three times that he brings uh, to pour over it. Now, this feels like a very strange thing that he does. You know, why would you try and light a fire where it's already wet? You know, we, in our family, we love to go camping. Um, and, uh, you know, one of, the th one of the nice things about camping is having a barbecue or a campfire. But the problem is you, we know, because we go camping in this country, you can't have a fire when it rains. So obviously we don't have many fires. Um, and so uh, what they do is they, they pour this water on, and, it, and with, we're left thinking, well, why is Elijah doing that? Well, it's because he wants to prove that the Lord is powerful, even the Lord is more powerful than, than anything else. He doesn't need any advantage. You know, he doesn't need dry wood. God can start a fire where the wood is wet in, in a pond. Laura Kenny um, is uh, the, most, uh, the most successful British female Olympian. She's won five medals, four golds and one silver. Uh, for a lot of her time, kind of, uh, kind of, I guess over the last maybe uh, ten years or so, she's been the the world number one female track cyclist. Um, yet every time she turns up to a race on the track, she doesn't t she doesn't think, well, I'm number one, I'm the best. I can just turn up in my jeans, my trainers, and on my kind of my hybrid going down to the shops bike. No, every time she turns up to a race, she's wearing all the, all the right clothes, all, all her Lycra with a super light bike that's been specifically designed exactly perfectly just for her. And she knows that she has to push it in order to win. You know, she has to do everything that she needs to do. She needs every advantage that she can get. Marginal gains is what they call it. Every tiny advantage Laura Kenny needs, despite the fact that she was the world number one. Whereas the Lord, and Elijah here, is not afraid. The Lord knows he is the number one. Elijah knows the Lord is number one. He needs no advantage from anything or anybody else in order to win this context. contest. And so, um, Elijah uh, steps up and he comes to this, this soaking wet altar with the bull. It's absolutely drenched in, uh, in water. And Elijah comes uh, and he prays in verses 36 and 37. And Elijah's prayer here, he prays to God, uh, obviously. Uh, but what he prays to God is he prays that God's will will be done. So what God wants will be done. And he prays to it for God's glory. Uh, answer me, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Elijah prays to God so that the people will turn back to him, because that's what God wants. That's why this is happening, so that the people's hearts, the, the whole of Israel, their hearts will come back to God. And so that is what Elijah prays for here. It's, if you consider that the, uh, the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, had been praying for most of the day, let's say kind of, you know, conservative estimates, six or eight hours, 450 people praying, and Elijah just prays one little prayer here. And God answers. And how does God answer? 
You know, it's, it's not, not a tiny little thing, although we will see God answering in a tiny little thing uh, next week, but, but God's answer is not like a little, oh, can, can somebody smell that smoke? Oh, look, there's a tiny little spark in there. It's like, oh, 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 oh. you know, it's like, it's like a fireball falling down from heaven at the end of Elijah's prayer. You know, then the fire of the Lord fell. Like the fire of the Lord, that's not a little thing, that's a huge thing. It kind of, it makes me think of, um, do you remember the story of the Exodus? The people followed a pillar of fire out of Egypt. I I think it's kind of like that. It's a giant pillar of fire coming down from heaven and burning everything, the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and the water. There was nothing left where the altar was. It was all turned to ash. There was no question about this. It was divine intervention. God had stepped up in an incredible way right here to prove Prove to his people that he is God. God intervened miraculously in uh, in this occasion because of the faith of one servant. Remember, the rest of the people they weren't bothered when when Elijah said, "You know, you need to choose between Baal and the Lord." The people were like, eh. you know, they weren't bothered. They didn't have the faith. It was only Elijah who trusted. God intervened miraculously because of the faith of his servant, and it was an undeniable miracle. Now, those words, I specifically chose those because if you think about it, that applies to Jesus as well. God's servant who trusted unconditionally in his Father, Jesus whose faith never wavered, who believed and acted according to his faith in his Father. And he stepped, he climbed the hill in order to make a sacrifice. A sacrifice that would bring the people back to him. A sacrifice that was completed by an undeniable miracle. The resurrection of Christ is undeniable, and and that is what brings us to believe in Jesus because of his resurrection. Just like the people uh, believed uh, and they cry, the Lord, he is God, in verse 39, we too say, Jesus is Lord because of his resurrection on Easter Sunday. So that brings us to our our third point here, the response uh, of of the people. Uh, So after the the giant fireball falls, what do the people do? They, you know, you can't you can't stand and be like, I'm not really sure after you've just seen a massive fireball fall fall from heaven. They fell prostrate and they cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. With the subtext, please don't burn me up with a fireball, God. You know, the people, they believe they are terrified. You know, this isn't just, they're not dancing around saying, well, hey, great, the Lord is God. They're absolutely petrified that they too are about to become ash. And so they know that the right thing to do is to say, the Lord, he is God, and to confess that with their mouths. And what does their faith lead them to do? Well, this is where this passage gets a little bit uncomfortable for us. Their faith leads them into action. Then Elijah commanded them, verse 40, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. So 450 men uh, were slaughtered as a result uh, of this. Now, this makes us feel very uncomfortable, but let me explain a little bit about what's going on here. So actually, what, what's going on is Elijah and the people are showing their, their faith by following God's commands. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, God speaks through Moses and says, if anybody uh, causes somebody to sin by, by calling them to, to follow after another God, if anyone tries to tempt somebody away, one of God's people away, Uh, then the punishment for that person who tries to call them away is death. You know, they must be killed immediately. Um, And so what is going on here is the people are following God's laws by doing this. Now, why is this such a severe punishment? 
You know, couldn't it, couldn't it just be, a, okay, guys, you know, you see what you need to do. You need to, uh, you need to repent and you need to stop doing that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Well, it's because sin and idolatry is a big deal. Also, I think, well, it's one thing to note here. We, we're not necessarily uh, told that all the prophets were killed. There may well have been some of the prophets who bowed down with the people of Israel. Uh, and accepted that the Lord is God. But the rest of them who don't, this is, this is their punishment, because sin and idolatry is a big deal. It's really, it's this serious. You know, the Bible says that, that sin leads to death, uh, and this is an example of, of sin leading to death. And so sin needs to be dealt with in us. Now, in this day and age, Obviously, this is not how we live our lives. You know, we don't, we don't go around killing people who, who tell us that, uh, uh, who, who try and convince us uh, of uh, uh, the, the truth of other religions. And that's not because we don't think that sin is important. No, actually, we, we still think that sin is important and that sin leads to death. But the difference that we live in now is after Jesus somebody else has taken the punishment for our sin. Somebody else has done that for us. Once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, Christ died for us. So we, no matter where we come from uh, to this point in, uh, in our lives, no matter what we've done, what sins we have committed in the past, we don't need to fear the punishment because Christ has died for us. He is the one who took the punishment for us when he died on the cross. So now, like the people of Israel, we can bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that's uh, the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. And then we have a, a finale here. Uh, so the finale here is from uh, kind of verse 41 to 46, and, it, and it's all about the rain. This is like the season finale. You know, like when you're watching a, a box set, and you've got kind of like the, the, the meta story, the meta narrative that's running all the way through, that's like set up in the first episode, and then kind of the, the protagonist, uh, the hero goes off and does other things, but all the way along, they're kind of dripping it through. How will we solve this big problem? And here we come back to the finale of 1 Kings season 3. How do we solve the problem of no rain? There's been a drought for, uh, for three years. Uh, so at the beginning of chapter 18, it says, After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So Elijah has been staying with the woman um, in, uh, where was she? Um, the woman in Zarephath for three years and eating with her, and there's been no rain uh, in the land for all, all that time. So three years later, the question is, what's going to happen with the rain? And so this, is, this has been the journey all along. How and why is God going God to kind of bring rain back to his people, bring, bring prosperity back to his people? And isn't it interesting that the battle here isn't Elijah standing on top of the mountain and saying, who can bring rain? Is it going to be Baal or is it going to be the Lord? Because actually, the rain is the symptom of a deeper problem with them. The, the rain is, is a symptom, the drought is a symptom of a deeper problem that they had, which was their idolatry, their, their, their mixing of religions. And so what Elijah is doing on the mountain is he's, he's treating the deeper problem. He's going beneath to say, actually, what you need to have dealt with first is your trust in God. And so, uh, and so now that that has been treated in the people, it means that God is free to be able to, to send the rain and to bless them. God pours out his blessing on his people so that they can be fruitful again and they can know his love with them. And again, we too, we are living in the finale, uh, if, you, if you will, of, uh, of life. You know, we have seen the miracle of Christ's resurrection, and we believe in Jesus, and we bow down and say, Jesus is Lord, and right now, 
God is pouring out his blessing on us. And although on a day like today, it may feel like God's blessing is rain, but actually that's not God's blessing right now. God's blessing is the Holy Spirit. God has poured out his Holy Spirit on us so that we can bear fruit uh, for him. And God gives us what we need, what we most need, which is what the Israelites most needed, which is a relationship with him, a restored relationship with him. So coming back to the beginning, uh, back what we were talking about, where do you think it is that you are trying to, to kind of mix and match? Where is it that you are trusting in God, but also trusting in something else? What is it that you're, what is the problem that you're trying to solve there? What's the issue that you're trying to address? Because we think that all these, all these other things are, are things that we need to solve, but actually the deepest need that we have is a relationship with God. And how do we get that? We get that by trusting in God, by confessing Jesus is Lord, and by accepting his spirit that he pours out on us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he was your faithful servant who climbed the hill in order to make the sacrifice Thank you that he trusted that you could always provide and that you would do a miracle. And thank you that it's because of Jesus' faith and his faithfulness, not because of our faithfulness, Lord, because we know that so often we are unfaithful to you. Thank you for Jesus' faithfulness to you, which means that we can live in the time of your blessing now, which means that we can live in the time of your blessing in relationship with you by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would uh, pour out your Spirit on us. Lord, help us to know the Spirit with us. Help us to, uh, to know you through the power of your Holy Spirit with us, Father. And may we love you more uh, because of that. And may you show us this week, show us where we are trying to mix our trust in you with our trust in other things. And may you help us by the power of your Spirit to turn away from those things and to put our faith and our trust holy in you, Lord. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.